Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all of you who have joined us today. I'd like to welcome you to what I hope will be an enlightening and informative discussion on inclusion and belonging in sports. I truly believe we cannot have a uh, conversation or truly celebrate 50 years of Title IX. We cannot talk about the benefits of healthy minds and healthy bodies without a discussion of everyone's ability to be included. I am Kia Clark, the CEO of the New York Liberty WNBA team, and I'm joined by an esteemed group of panelists. Um, I'll start by introducing each of them. We have with us Loretta Claiborne, the Chief Inspiration Officer for Special Olympics Incorporated, Tiff Kunin, the Senior Program Manager, Health and Wellness, National Recreation and Parks Association, and Becca Myers, from the Paralympic gold medalist, world champion, advocate for disability and equality. I'd love to jump right in. I know we don't have a ton of time. We have so many great things to talk about. Um, we could have even recorded our green room session, I feel like, and it would have been great content for everyone. Um, but I'll start the discussion and I'll take it from a personal perspective. I'm gonna ask each of you, what comes to mind? What does it mean to you when we say belonging in sports and physical activity? Uh, I'll start with you, Tiff. Sure, thanks Kia. Thanks Loretta, Becca for sharing this platform with me. I'm excited to be here with you all. Um, well, belonging in sports and activity, uh, first, you know, to set the stage, you know, recreational sports and physical activity are platforms on which individuals from different groups can interact and build relationships and ultimately find community. Unfortunately, for many individuals, playing recreational sports has cultivated feelings of exclusion more so than gaining the positive, important benefits of play, like building a sense of community, learning key life skills, like problem solving and leadership. Um, helping youth hone their own mental focus and cultivating a path for positive social emotional development. That said, uh, belonging in sports and activity means that participants can sense that they are safe. They are safe from bullying. They are safe from discrimination. They are safe from physical, emotional, and psychological harm. A sense of belonging means that these athletes and these individuals who want to participate are safe to live authentically without repercussions. They are safe to engage with and grow with their peers. They are safe to simply play. They're safe to exist. Thank you so much, Tiff. Becca, we'll hop to you. What, what does belonging mean to you? Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm very excited to share my experience. So for me, what comes to mind for me for when we say belonging in sports and activity is identity. Personally, I have multiple disabilities. I am deaf and visually impaired. And growing up, I did not know where I belonged in this world as a deafblind kid. I discovered the sport of swimming and I fell in love with it. So when I was growing up, I was known as Becca the swimmer, not Becca the deafblind kid. And I loved how my identity, my passion for swimming gave me my identity in this world. Swimming allowed me to discover who I am as a person. Swimming taught me life skills and gave me a voice that gave me a voice that I use on a daily basis. So swimming also gave me confidence as a person with multiple disabilities that I can achieve big, big things through hard work and believing in myself. So being involved in sports or physical activities gives us a place in this world. I love that. I love that. Thank you. Loretta, we'll move over to you. Yes, that, I'll go back to what the one lady said. People looked at her as a swimmer, but I really didn't have an identity as a child growing up. A lot of kids excluded themselves from me because of my intellectual disability. I didn't have that chance, so I would start running. I started running at the age of 12, and they would say the kid who runs around the projects, the whole project, and I can remember being in school I was always excluded until it was something with running or something with fighting. That's the only time people really knew me. They didn't know me as Loretta. I mean, kids knew my name, but they didn't really know. I got ridiculed. I got, it was just awful. It was just sad how I got bullied as a person. But in high school, when I helped start the track team before Title IX, I never reaped no benefits, but I was the one who went to the principal. 
I was the one who got the signatures. And then I was also the one that we did get out of running in the hall onto the track at the meadow field when the guys were going. Uh, I got told, we don't want no retards here. But I got beyond that. And sport was the thing that drew me. Number one, people would look at me in the community and say, oh, you're going to be big, just like your mother. And that made me have a complex. That Because my mom was a big, bold woman. She was a lovely woman. I mean, she, she stood up for everybody. But I didn't want to be like that. I didn't want to be the person that people thought I would be. And I, I think the reason why I am here today, not only as a board of director of Special Olympics who owns my own house, who votes, who does everything, and sometime in the community complain to the mayor. They'll look at me now and says, oh, Loretta, you need to go to the mayor because that light is out. So I'm the person in my community they look up to now. And that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for sport. Sport has done so much for me, not only physically, and I was always told by my mom, oh, you shouldn't run like that. You're going to be... You know, that's going to hurt you. You're female. Well, obviously it didn't hurt me. I could still do 30 to 40 men's push-ups to this day, but I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for sport. I'll go out there and run three or four miles, five miles. I ran 26 marathons. I ran a 303 in Boston, all self-trained. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for sport. And I have always said to people, I would probably be either six feet under or in somebody's prison, because I thought this was the way it's going to get me to do life. Now I know when I go out there and run, I can think. I can think what I need to say to somebody on the board. I can think when I need to sit in somebody's courtroom, and I have been in court. I can basically handle every issue if I can get a chance to do my sit-ups, push-ups, and get out there and run, because I use it now today as a vehicle to think instead of just being so angry. So super inspiring and thank all of you for sharing such personal and, uh, you know, um, like I said, when you talk about identity, like you said, I should say, and you talk about safety, um, you know, I think that resonates with so many people. Um, another another question for all of you, and, and I'll jump in on this one too, since I work in sports, um, as we watch sports or we participate in sports, um, I know you're still competing, Loretta, um, Tiff, yes. maybe you as well, maybe all of you. Um, how would you grade inclusion in sports today? Um, what grade would you give, you know, just sort of the lay of the land? We all know where we started from, but just looking, you know, in the current time right now, how would you, what would you grade us at? And, and I'll take it first. Um, my perspective is really centered on youth, the inclusion of youth in sports and girls and women. And I, I'd say from that purview, I'd say it's a B minus. Um, you see declining participation um, a lot in youth sports, um, which to me just speaks volumes to less access, which is unfortunate and something that I think collectively we all need to work on. But then on the other side, you see the more elite athlete with more opportunities. If you're really serious about your sport, there's probably more opportunity for you to play at a high level, to get access, to get in front of people. Um, so I think that's on, you know, a, an uphill swing. So it's it's a positive. And then I'd also say, you know, at the professional level, we see more and more again from the purview of women. Um, the women's leagues are doing much better. There are more women's leagues. There are more. more there are more opportunities for women to play at the professional level. When I think about obviously the WNBA, when I think about the NWSL, when I even think about Athletes Unlimited and the opportunities that just came about in the sports of softball and lacrosse, um, you know, volleyball. Um, I was a volleyball player in high school too. That's exciting to me. So while I think we still have a long way to go, I think there are absolutely a lot of, there's a lot of progress being made. Um, so with that, you know, I'd love to hear from you. What grade would you give? And uh, I'll start with you, Becca. So the grade I would give um, inclusion in sports today is decent. We have broken barriers as those with disabilities in mainstream sports but we still have a long way to go. The world is not built for us with disabilities and we are still fighting for inclusion in sports and activities. For me personally, I have had to fight to get equal and accessible accommodations and inclusion in swimming throughout my entire career. 
I have had my setbacks as well as great experience. However, my latest encounter with inclusion in sports occurred last summer leading into the 2020 Tokyo Paralympic Games. I was denied a basic and reasonable accommodation that I needed in order to be successful. I was shocked that an organization who prided themselves on promoting disability sports denied me, a person with multiple disabilities, her accommodation. I was excluded from participating because they did not take time to understand what I needed in order to be successful in sports. I spoke up so that future generation, future athletes do not have to suffer the way I suffered. We still have a lot of work to do. Completely agree, completely agree. Loretta, what, how would you I, rate? I would rate it maybe a C because we have to start with our young children when they don't have physical fitness in our schools and it's not offered to them. And especially at this time, if you see a lot of young youth during medications, they're overweight. And as an older athlete, as I get older and I work more or less with Special Olympics, we, we provide sport for over 6 million athletes with and without intellectual disabilities. So we go into the schools, we try to break down the stereotype. We try to bring our athletes who are in special education in with the normal student to play basketball, to play bocce or to run track, we call it unified. And I think until we are more unified in sport, giving to not only male, but male and female in their own right, until we do that, things are not going to change. And we have to start with our youth. We have to get edu physical education back into the schools. I know the schools where I live at in the city, and I go to schools all over. Right now, I'm in a rural area. They have phys ed. Little school from kindergarten to 12th grade, they have phys ed. But when I go back to my home and I see these little kids walking down the street, obesity, diabetes and stuff, and I go to school and say, do you have gym? Oh, no, we don't have gym. You have recess, but you don't have gym. So until we structure and get our kids to get back in shape to play, it's okay to play and play safe. And the one of the safe havens would be in the school because of the violence in our communities today with the shooting. No, you don't see kids on the court playing basketball, those little kids. And I said yesterday to a lady, I said, you know what? I hadn't seen one kid outside. We got out of church and I saw one kid hitting the ball with a bat into a net. So that kid's going to be an elite athlete. We need to reach all children that everyone had the safe and opportunity environment to sport. So I still rate sports as a C for all children, for all people. I'm an older athlete. Now I'm fighting for older athletes. When my organization is Special Olympics, that we focus not on just the very young, but the whole gambit from the cradle to the grave, that every athlete who walks onto a Special Olympics field has opportunity to participate in sport, whether it's recreational or competition, and we offer both. So many great thoughts there, Loretta, and it's actually unimaginable to me to think about being in elementary school and, or even middle school and not having gym. Um, I still enjoy gym in high school, so um, you know I think it's a, a perfect segue to to you, Tiff because of the work that you do. It's really a solution really to what's not happening on the educational side in some areas. I'm curious what your thoughts are just in terms of how we're doing. Yeah, sure. Um, great lead up by both Becca and Loretta here. And I should talk, I should let folks know that I'm coming from the lens of somebody who has worked with social participation with physical activity and athletics across the life cycle as both a coach and an athlete but also somebody who focuses their energy on trans and non-binary rights in this space um, as a trans masculine identified athlete myself. And for my grade, I'm going to give it a C as well, coming from that lens, uh, maybe a C minus uh, from that specific lens itself. You know, allyship and support for women and girls in sports, transgender and non-binary individuals in sport, athletes of color, new Americans like refugees and immigrants and athletes with different abilities continues to grow. And thanks to outlets like social media and especially conversations like this is becoming increasingly invisible or increasingly visible. 
Um, today, there are more and more brave young trans and non-binary athletes who are living authentically while participating in recreational and school-based sports. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the spaces they're participating in are inherently inclusive and safe. Um, there are discrimina discriminatory practices that continue to prevent trans and non-binary students from participating in and being fully immersed in the K-12 learning communities, as Loretta was alluding to, as their cisgender peers. Um, and this also trickles across the lines of racism, xenophobia, et cetera. Um, you know, unfortunately, the reality that we're facing when it comes to youth sports and physical activity, um, especially if we look at it, if I look at it from my lens as somebody who's an advocate for trans and non-binary youth to be in these sports spaces, there continues to be a suffocating and vile rhetoric around the topic. Um, so one space in my community might be a safe, inclusive space for young athletes, regardless of their race and ethnicity or their first language or their gender identity, et cetera. This doesn't mean that all members of the community feel or act in the same way. So with that, I feel personally that we still have a lot of work to do to move the needle forward on inclusion in sports today. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't note some of our wins we've had in this area. For example, the visibility of trans athletes in the um, Olympic in the past in the previous Olympics, um, and the fact that we do have 17 states that have friendly policies that help facilitate the full inclusion of trans and non-binary students in high school athletics. Um, and I, I feel very passionately and strongly that as more brave young athletes live authentically and loudly, and as more courageous athletes and advocates across all levels, like us in this room, probably a lot of you who are joining us for the panel show their support, we're gonna to continue to see the scale shift for a more positive future that supports and celebrates our increasingly diverse young population. So work to be done. I think yeah. collectively we, we we would all agree, but I, I agree. I think someone said it, conversations like this and a meeting of the minds and bringing together people who are doing the work in various spaces is how we're gonna take a step forward. Um, so appreciate all of all of your answers there. Tiff, I'd love to, to stay with you for, for one quick second. This is probably the, the most exciting um, question that I wanted to ask on this call because I am a park and rec kid. Um, given your experience in program management on the park and parks and recreation side, um, you've mentioned a little bit already, but can you expand a little bit, expound a little bit on what do inclus inclusive sports environments look like? What do they sound like? What do they feel like? And you've, you've said you've mentioned safety quite a few times. And, you know, um, I think that's one of the glaring ones. But I'd love to you know, take a step more into your world and, and what that what that looks like. Sure. Thanks so much, Kia. I venture to say that most of us in this room are park and rec kids. Um, so that's that's really fun to hear. Um, at the National Recreation and Park Association, we think everybody's a park and rec kid. Um, well, let me start with a little bit of context and just say that it takes a great deal of courage, even in 2022, to say, hey, I'm going to play, insert whatever sport it is, whether or not it fits the mold society has created for me. Earlier in our green room session, we were talking about female bodied athletes uh, wanting to play football in high school and college and being denied those types of opportunities. Um, there's a lot of people today who say, I'm going to play it, whether or not society says that I should. I think we also need to remember that every single day, someone is fighting for their right to simply exist and engage with their peers. Every single day, there's a young athlete living in fear of what tomorrow will bring. Um, and I was once that young athlete, so I'll share a little anecdote here. Um, I do need to provide a disclaimer that my experiences as a white, trans, masculine identified athlete do come from a position of privilege due largely to my race. Um, and my experiences should not be treated nor consumed as a monolithic representation of any athlete's experiences. Um, but I have felt most safe and included later in life as an adult athlete. Um, my high school and collegiate athletic experiences had negative um, experiences within them, both with my gender identity and sexuality. I was bullied not only by peers, but even at the college level, bullied by administrators, including my coach. Um, since entering the world of adult recreational sports on this side of everything, um, I felt more and more included as time goes on. And I attribute this to the growing visibility of trans and non-binary athletes, especially young athletes that I mentioned earlier. 
much of the safety here. There's that word safety again, uh, because that's a really big part of it for me. You know, feeling safe, feeling like I can be where I'm supposed to be because I want to be there and I can be there. Much of the safety I feel is a direct result of the bravery and courage others have taken, others who are much younger, younger than me. So that said, in terms of programming, operation, services, and facilities, especially in coming from the park and recreation side of it, um, embodying inclusion demands that no one is excluded or required to face additional rules or scrutiny to fully participate in sports. Um, from the trans and non-binary side of things, it is a human right to be recognized as the gender for which one identifies. Um, and sometimes we as a society put on blinders and limit the idea of sports environments to the demographic makeup of a team. So for example, gender, age, race, and ability. And we as society often forget about the less seen parts of the environment, which fall into our operations, our facilities and services like bathrooms, locker rooms, changing areas, uniform selection, uh, use of pronouns and preferred names, et cetera. So an inclusive sports environment also means that the adult leaders, the coaches and the administrators lead by example, share their own pronouns, correct misgendering, stepping in to mitigate unsafe situations like harassment and bullying. Inclusive sports environment in this context means that no athlete should ever be afraid of being outed or harmed by their sport. And an inclusive sports environment simply steps up and steps in when individuals are continuing to be pushed to the margins of society. Um, inclusive sports environments, the, the last thing that I'll say in this space is that they should foster a feeling of safety and belonging in which an individual can have a positive experience in the sport and physical activity without fear of being injured physically, mentally, or emotionally. Um, some of the best practices to support transgender non-binary inclusion in sports include respecting individuals, um, bringing those individuals to the table who are most affected by, by rules and policies, um, and fostering positive physical environments like I alluded to earlier. Uh, lack of access to affirming spaces and a community that supports youth, regardless of their background and identity, has specifically been tied to increased suicidality and decreased mental health of youth, um, especially transgender and non-binary youth and youth of color. You know, with the well-documented benefits of sports and physical activity across the lifespan that we've talked about here already, exclusion from these activities puts the lives of youth in these categories, these social categories at an even greater risk. Yeah, so, so much and everything about what you just said is so important because of the entry point, I think. When I think about providing spaces where people are safe, providing spaces where people can be themselves at a young age, that lives with, with you forever. I mean, I think we could all remember our first memory of playing sports or who we were with and how we were received and what were the coaches like and what were the coaches talking about, but to be seen that maybe, you know, you know, in the summer at a program is, is a huge, huge deal. And I just commend you again for the work that you're doing. And, you know, I think um, the WNBA has, has a couple of non-binary players within our league. And I think on the professional level, it's like we haven't existed at this moment for, for long enough for it to just be happenstance. But there are so many people making an effort. And part of it is the effort, right? We have to, you know, be more inclusive. We have to be open. We have to educate the coaches, the administrators, the referees, like everyone. Um, so really appreciate everything that you said. Um, Loretta, I'm going to actually switch gears and, and, and uh, I'd love for you to talk about your experience as an athlete um, and chief inspiration officer for Special Olympics. When have you felt most included while participating in sports or any physical activity? You gave us a little sneak peek on the early years, but yes. let's talk about when you felt included. You know what? I did not feel included in the school. This year is going to be my 50th uh, reunion, and I never went to a reunion because of not being included. And the only way I got an A in school was verbally through health class because it was most, mostly verbal. But Jim was my A. Jim was my A. That's the time I wanted to be included. And it's very, very important for young people to be included because no matter how old you get, you're going to remember what happened to you when you were younger. I felt included when I got in the Special Olympics. And I got in the Special Olympics. I thought maybe the first Special Olympic practice I went to, I looked at my mom. She says, how was it? 
And I said, I quit. And she looked at me, she said, you don't quit anything, you understand? Because you quit today, you will be always quitting through the rest of your life. And like I said, we had to go to so many practices. It was a year I had to be in the program. And then when I got into the program, I went to Westchester State University, 1971. Nobody bullied me. Nobody called me names. I didn't hear the word retard, stupid, idiot. I felt like I was on top of the world when I got that medal around my neck in 1971. But why did I have to wait till I get to high school, out of high school, to be included when I so badly, this is about a healthier youth generation for healthier girls as young people. This is what this whole conference is about. And young girls need to feel healthier in their early years so that they can be more positive in their older years. It's a shame that I had to wait till I was out of school to be accepted and feel good about myself. And once I got into Special Olympics, 52 years later, I still feel as though my dream has became a reality. Not when I speak to somebody, I always said, my dream is your reality. When I got into Special Olympics, my dream became my reality that I am still today as happy as I was about being a part of sport. And I said, if it wasn't for sport and me being included, I think I would have been gone a long time ago. My mother died at the age of 63. Mm. So it's sport that keeps me alive. First of all, guy, good family and sport, good friends. And important to note, you said 1971. So this is before Four Title, Title Nine Nine. was passed. So you are the, the truest of pioneers and laying a foundation. So, so thank you for that and, and persevering through, certainly, pre-Title I Nine. remember the days of going to karate tournaments and there was no, no dressing room for us girls. And the guys would be all there. It'd be me, thousand guys, and maybe one or two other girls. And the key was, is how to undress without people seeing your undergarments. So mm -hmm. I wore a t-shirt that I would slip over under my clothes and then slip my gi on and then slip the t-shirt off. Mm -hmm. That's how bad it was. Whew. Good. Thank goodness for some progress. Um, Becca, what do you see as one of the biggest hurdles to getting all parties on board with inclusion and equity within sports? Communication, I think, is key. We, we need to communicate with each other. We need to listen to each other because when we listen to those with disabilities and what we need in order to be successful, then sports become so much more enjoyable. So communication, trusting those with disabilities, knowing what they need, because we are the best judge of ourselves. So that's what I believe we, we need to continue to work on. I completely agree. Communication is the key to so many things, which is why I so appreciate this conversation. Um, it's spawning, you know, uh, dialogue between us, but I'm sure there are those of you listening at home who have thoughts, who are working within your own communities, who may be coaches, who may be parents. Um, all of it matters and really um, voicing need and saying, you know, what we need and feel is, is so, so, so important. Um, Tiff, I want to come back to you. How do you keep our young people, how do we keep our young people motivated to participate in sports and physical activity? I'm looking for tips um, for everyone, but I'm also looking for tips because I have two young children. They're 10 and 8. And while, you know, they they get out and, you know, they'll throw a ball and they, they do engage it's tough when you have modern technology and phones yeah. and tablets to compete with. So I'm just curious if there are any tips or tactics that you could share. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that's been brought up over and over is communication. And that's in having those voices at the table. You know, we say that a lot in, in advocacy work and uh, social justice and health equity work, because we need to have that population that we want to help at the table. That includes our youth. Find out what your youth are feeling. Find out what they are seeing. Ask questions. Give them a space in which they feel like not only that they are safe, 
but they feel like their opinion and their thoughts are valued because there's a lot more to youth sports than just playing a sport and staying fit, right? That gives you the opportunity to be in a space where you learn how to communicate with different folks, you know, across, across the board. Um, so give, give youth the voice and the agency to have those conversations, not only with you, not only with administrators of these sports, but also to have that voice among their peers. So uh, going back to the communication and just making sure that that voice of the youth is at the table, what do they want? I, I say it all the time at work when we talk about engaging youth, we have to engage actual youth because as much as we hate to say it, we're no longer the cool crowd, right? We're no longer the cool generation. And my seven-year-old niece will probably be able to tell me a lot more about life on the baseball field than I could ever tell her at this point in time. Oh, so true. Uh, Loretta, same question. Same question. I think the big problem is we got to start with parents. We need to get away our kids away from this thing and other devices. Too many kids are sitting down doing this. They're not communicating. They're not talking. They go to a restaurant. I've watched people at a restaurant and every one of the kids and the parents were sitting there. Why do you go to a restaurant? You want to communicate. Kids need to be in groups to play and develop not only the physical fitness of the sport, and a lot of kids today think they have to be the best at something. The lot of the parents think the reason why my kid is not out there because he is not the best. I just told my best friend about her little boy. She says, oh, I went to a track meet and he was the last and he was terrible. And I turned around and looked at her. I said, nope, 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 nope. You should say to him, you did good. You did your best. Do you like it? Are you having a good time? We need to motivate our children. And the more we think that our children need to be like the people on TV, more of our kids are not going to be out there to play. Our kids need to be outside. They need to get that fresh air. They need to step in that dirt. And they need to be in that group where they can develop friends playing softball. It's okay to play softball in the dirt. It's okay to play soccer with a ball that's not a soccer ball. It's about children growing until we get our children back playing things are not going to change. Our children are learning too much on this day. Amen and to I that think one, Loretta. We as a society need to get back to teaching our children to play. And when you play, you have fun and you develop friendships. And those who you are playing with also have fun. We're, I don't want to see our children have a lost generation. Completely agree with you, Loretta, and, and thank you for your insights there. Um, I'm all with you about the phones and, and the tablets. Um, Becca, what effective actions can a supporter take locally to help push for equity? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Sure. What effective actions can a supporter take locally to help push for, for more equity in sports? Like I've said before, communication is key and just open dialogue, making people aware. I think awareness is also key because if you don't know, you don't know. So a safe space, allowing kids to come and just talk and things like that. So I think that that's what we need to work on. It's like the foundation. So sure. And in sort of in the same vein. Tiff, I'm, I'm going to throw to you since since you've coached as well. Um, how do we help coaches tap into and leverage race, culture and climate for the whole team instead of just relying on what they know, what they're comfortable doing? Um, how do we you know, prepare the coaches a little bit? Yeah, that's a that's a really great question because we're talking about you know coaches who span a couple different generations we're talking about coaches from different geographic areas of the united states and we're talking about a topic that has been polarized uh probably for our entire lives the folks of us who are on this panel right now and even more so in recent years i think there are five tips uh that i would say for folks uh in that space and that's one, uh, to respect folks, to, to find the respect that you expect people to give you and give that to other folks in terms of transgender, non-binary folks. That means using their names and their pronouns. 
Um, confidentiality, you know, protecting the privacy of, of youth who confide in you and athletes who confide in you, um, you know, making sure that an athlete feels safe to let you know that they feel discriminated against or that something adverse is happening in that sports environment. Um, being open to listening and supporting that athlete and those athletes that are in the community. Um, educating ourselves. So coaches, that's a big part. I mean, it's all a journey and every journey is different. So it's important to continue to stay up on education. Um, at National Recreation and Park Association, we pride ourselves on having a robust professional development portfolio that includes topics like the ones we're talking about today. You know, we work closely with our friends at Alliance for Healthier Generation and see a lot of the same work being done across our portfolios. And that includes um, education opportunities. Um, and with the education, just understanding that each of us in this room, on this panel, each of us listening at home, and everybody across the country are probably in a little bit of a different area with their journey. And the journey looks different. We've all described different pathways today. Um, and we, we all became successful. We all were able to sit in this room together, but the journey looked different for all of us because we had to learn along the way. We opened our minds and we had to continue to learn and evolve um, as new evidence was provided to us and as new information was brought to us. So respect, provide confidentiality, support your athletes, understand that education is key and that that educational journey is going to look different across the board. Couldn't agree more. Very well said. Um, Loretta, what do you think we need more of to ensure that inclusivity continues to improve across all levels of play? Educate, educate, educate. I always tell children when I go to a school, I say to a child, how many pockets does your jeans have? And the kid will count the pockets. A lot of kids wear jeans in a lot of the areas. They said four. I said, what about that little pocket there? It has five pockets. Oh, Miss Loretta, it has five pockets. I said, that's your education. You want to put your education in that pocket and keep it. You don't get anywhere if you don't educate. Communication and education are the two keys that we need from the very low level on up. Special Olympics, when we went into schools, there was a lot of bullying. We have data, we have research that when we started our unified programs, going into the school where students talk to other students and they get together and they have a, a class, then they might have a sport after that class that they play. They found out the normal students thought that they were going to teach the students with ID a lesson. You go back to those normal students and says, oh, what did you teach them? It says, not what I taught them, it's what I learned about them and what they learned about me. And it came to a consensus that we all had the same likes as students, that we all want to go to the dance, that we all want to dance, and that we all want to be there to put that dance together, that everyone sits at the same table and eats the same meal and has the same com communication. And that's what it's about, communication and education from the bottom, from the parent, from the teacher, from the rec ed, a lot of times we put people on our, in our parks to do park and rec. And a lot of the young people are not educated to accept people who are differently abled or come from a different background because they were never educated. Or in today's technology, we have these iPads, we have everything. Tell that person, go and read about African-American children. Go and read about children with intellectual and physical disabilities. Go and read about the young boys who had moved in the neighborhood from Afghanistan, it takes you a couple of minutes. It takes you a couple of minutes in today's society. If yeah. you want to invest a half hour to learn about something, it's going to be more than worth it. That half hour is going to bring a lot of knowledge to you as that kid comes on your park and rec or in your school. We have the tools, we need to educate. So, so many great nuggets. I hope you all are taking notes. Education has been through and through this entire conversation. Communication has come through and through over and over again, safety. Um, and we're talking about belonging. We're talking about inclusiveness. And it's so beautiful when we can get to that level where everyone 
feels like they are accepted. We're running up on time, so I want to leave everyone with again, um, because you have such powerful stories. Um, personally, what is the biggest lesson that sports has taught each of you? Um, I'd love to know um, when you look back on your full career and some of us still going, um, some of us still competing. What's the biggest lesson that sports has taught you over over your years? Tiff, we'll start with you. Ooh, lots of lessons there for Shirky, as you alluded to. Um, but I really think that sports has taught me humility, um, both with my physical ability, um, my intellectual ability, but also my ability to engage with other individuals. Through sports, I've been exposed to um, more people who I would have never been exposed to in my entire life. I've had the opportunity to play sports um, overseas. I've had the opportunity to play sports here in the States um, at different levels. And I think that the humility that sports has taught me has been something that I can hold on to as an anchor as I move through life, as I move through work, as I move through my educational pursuits, as I move through different opportunities like being in these spaces um, with, with you all. Um, and I think that it's really taught me that the most important thing that we can do is center the experiences of those who are most affected by this conversation in its totality. So young people simply want to and deserve to live without fear or repercussions simply because other social identities, whether that is race, socioeconomic status, sexuality, ability, gender identity, and so forth. Um, so yeah, so humility and being able to center the experiences of folks who are most affected. Thank you. Becca, biggest lesson learned from sports. It's a really good question because swimming has taught me so many different life skills and has given me my identity as a person. But I would have to say the biggest lesson I have taken away from swimming is confidence, confidence in myself. As I shared earlier, growing up, I didn't know who I was as a deafblind kid. So swimming gave me confidence and the ability to find my place in this world, the ability to learn other skills that I carry to this day, the ability to speak up for what I need, the ability to communicate with others. It's just so powerful how swimming gave me confidence in myself to work hard, believe in myself, and big things will happen. Thank you. Confidence. Loretta, we'll end with you. You know, I used to think that I didn't count. I was a nobody, but my mother didn't let me do that. Special Olympics didn't let me do that. But when I really truly got into sport, I think sport taught me that I can be successful within myself. What is success? So some people, they have a lot of money. They have a big house. But to me, success is that I can be me no matter where I'm at no matter where I am, no matter what somebody says something, I still have a little uh, thing when I'm on a public bus or downtown and I'll hear somebody whisper, but I let that go. And sport has taught me that you can overcome that, not with your fist, but you can overcome that with what you will learn from sport. So I learned that when somebody is negative towards me, I used to get so angry, no more. I can be successful. I look above them and go on. And I have, have to say that sport has taught me so much in life, but success within myself, that's what sport has taught me. Thank you so much. Thank you for all of you for listening today. Um, I don't think we could have ended on a better note than what inclusivity means, what belonging means, and really what the dividend pays, um, humility, confidence, success. Um, I think those are attributes all of us need, all of us want. Um, I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. Thank you to Tiff, Becca, and Loretta for giving your insights, sharing your personal stories. Um, we are actually gonna move into a 10 minute break and the next session will begin thereafter on redefining health. Thank you all again.